Moving on and um, we'll hand over to Abby to, to talk us through the campaign that she admires. Thank you so much. Uh, hi everyone. So yeah, as mentioned, my name is Abby. I'm from Future Friends Games. Um, I'm relatively new to the games industry. I'm approaching my first year, but I have lots of experience in content creation. I'm a cosplayer. I've worked with uh, companies like PlayStation. Um, and I originally came into Future Friends as publishing executive, but now I just do a little bit of everything. Uh, my main job is social media management, and I basically make TikToks. I am a TikTok machine. Um, and Future Friends Games, if you're not familiar with us, we help publish amazing indie games, uh, including Vampire Survivors. Uh, we've worked on Frog Detective, uh, we're working on Europa, Summer House, some really, really cool titles. Um, and so I have obviously got first pick of the games. And who here has heard of another crab's treasure? Yay! Good marketing! <laughs> so that's the game that I really wanted to take a look at because their, their promotional campaign from the beginning has just been absolutely incredible. They have been absolutely incredible with how they promote the games. You've probably seen their TikToks or their tweets hanging around. They are incredibly good at, in their own words, professional shit posting. Um, the whole way that they've marketed this has been memes and just being really, really personal, which is what I wanted to talk about. Um, so if you're not familiar with Another Crab's Treasure, it's essentially what, how do they market it? They market it as uh, SpongeBob meets Dark Souls. It's, <laughs> <laughs> it's a Souls-like game that's set obviously under the sea, um, and you play it as Krill, this little crab guy. Um, and that's the general gist of the game. And obviously Souls-like games are so popular, they have such, such intense fandoms. But this is a little bit of a different genre, and the way they've really lent into it has been incredible. Um, so for a little bit of like context on their... I want to just show you like one of their videos. So they made this video for April Fools. So originally, obviously, they were like, oh, we're working on a Dark Souls game. And uh, obviously people were like, oh my gosh, Elden Ring and Dark Souls. So they decided to make this video for April Fools, which I just want to show as a general like introduction into their sense of humor because it's absolutely excellent. Have you looked at our bright, colorful Souls-like game yeah. and thought, this is too happy. We need more dark and mysterious Souls-like games. There just isn't enough out there. Fair not, fellow gamer, we have added a new feature to another crab's treasure, Dark Souls-like mode. This new feature will immediately remove all the vibrant colors in the game and replace it with a more desaturated and dark color scheme. Does Krill appear too happy? Let's remove that sparkle in his eyes and determination for adventure. In Dark Souls-like mode, Krill will become depressed. Look at the difference in his walk, not a hope in sight. If Krill's depression starts to ruin your experience, Dark Souls-like mode unlocks a new costume. You might recognize it for a redacted, redacted, copyright strike redacted. This costume will hide Krill's defeated face, so you can pretend everything's fine. Dark Souls-like mode also turns all levels into a poison swamp, because it's not a real Souls-like game without one. Look at that poisony goodness. We also added Arno Londo. <laughs> So that's just like a little insight into their sense of humor. Paige, the community manager who was reading that, uh, who was doing the video, she is incredible. And my main, obviously I realize we've got quite limited time, um, but just to give you an idea of how well their accounts have done. So their TikTok followers are 360,000 with over 10 million likes. And their Twitter has reached 95,000 followers, which is just insane numbers for indie games. And the main takeaway from another Crab's Treasure is that devs are part of the social team and social team are part of the devs. They work so closely together. Um, they have an absolutely fantastic GDC talk I'd recommend checking out where Nick and Paige talk about how they do their marketing. You can just Google it. Um, and it's such a hugely team-oriented game. And one of their biggest takeaways that they found is you need to invest dev time into social media and content creation because in the end, when a team is working on a game, devs are part of the content creation, you know? So the fact that they Paige had such easy access to the devs and could just be like, hey, could you just put Anna Orlando in the game? They were like, yeah, sure. Um, it's it's just so well done and they're just so good at selling. I don't want to take too much time, so I will pass on and I will talk more about general stuff afterwards. Because <laughs> so I've got a couple of other videos I can show after. <laughs> As was said, my name is Jack. I work for a company called George Truly. Uh, we are a, um, a very similar company, really, to what you're going to hear here. Uh, but we work with um, 
I particularly work on social media for uh, Wizards of the Coast, uh, particularly on the Magic the Gathering accounts. Uh, we also do a lot of work um, just generally, uh, particularly with content creators uh, for a whole range of clients from indie developers all the way to kind of, um, much larger developers as well and publishers. And the, the game that I want to talk to you about today is Content Warning. Um, has anyone here heard of Content Warning? Okay, good, good marketing. I'm going to copy exactly what I said. Um, so one of the things in particular that I want to talk about with Content Warning isn't actually the build-up um, to the campaign. So with, with another Crouch Treasure, we obviously saw uh, these were the you know, pre-release pre um, marketing materials that kind of hyping up the game. Now, you would have spent months, years, um, decades, <laughs> potentially working on your game, uh, building up the marketing for this, um, preparing for launch, and then often the trap that a lot of uh, developers, especially indie developers, fall into is you launch your game um, after doing a bunch of marketing, it does really well, and then you're like, good, I'm done. And then I have to touch it again. Um, that's, that's, you know, I, I, it's been a success, and I don't need to look at it anymore. But one of the things that um, you can tap into, and I really recommend you doing, is that once you have launched your game, there are the lots of kind of boring things that come afterwards. One of them in particular being patch notes. So patch notes are something that nearly every game nowadays will need at some point, um, and expressing that information can be very, very boring. You could do it on Twitter or on Steam or however you want to do it, just in a lengthy list of everything that you've changed about the game. Or you can do it in a little bit of a fun way alongside that. Um, so I'm going to show you a video now, just a bit of context. Um, Breaking news, this is Sora from the Content Warning team. We have a patch. We've added recorder, reporter mics, party poopers, <laughs> and a sound player. <laughs> so, Content Warning is a game where you play as basically a YouTuber in this spooky world. You go underground and there's all these horrors and you have to film them, uh, get as much scary content as you can, bring it back to the surface and then release a scary YouTube video, in like a Blair Witch style um, bit of video. Um, and as you just saw, they used all of the in-game assets and materials and one thing you can do in Content Warning is whenever you film anything, you can download it directly to your computer afterwards. Um, I've made this game, I've, I've downloaded many of mine and my friends' videos that we've made in the game um, just because they're hilarious and it's really nice to see that what they've done is they've directly shown off what is new to the game through the game um, in, in this, obviously this, this humorous way. Now just as Abby was saying, this works because the dev team and the um, and the social media team are so closely linked that they, they're they one and the same. I mean, they can say to the dev team, look, you've got this patch, why don't we do it in-game? And the devs are able to do so. And it's really nice because one of the things that indie developers have, particularly over um, you know, much bigger um, publishing houses or developers, is that you're really, you can be authentic. It's, it's you and a few people usually making a game, and that's something that people already love and you should tap into. In this case as well, it's a game about being social, about spending time with your friends, and it's nice to see that the development team are clearly friends, they're having fun, that you're seeing exactly what you do in the game through these patch notes, which are usually something that's quite boring. So, I, so what I guess, I'm just not gonna take up too much time, but what I'm trying to say is that consider how the boring elements that come after a game has been released, such as patch notes, how they can be implemented into a marketing campaign and tap into the type of things that your game has to offer. You know, there may be things like they've done here where you can directly show patch notes within the game's content, or there might be something that's more relatable to your own game itself. Um, that's something for you to go away and think about probably with your own titles, but um, there's definitely a lot more that can be done with patch notes than just a lengthy list of we've increased run speed by 0.2% or anything like that. And with that, I will um, I'll pass over to others. Go. Thanks a lot. So um, for those who weren't here this morning, uh, Matt's from Vicos PR. So 
much like these guys are also a marketing agency. Um, I'm here in the UK, but we've got team members all across the globe, US, Europe, Australia. Makes meeting times for company meetings interesting. One of us always has to do the, the late night slots. Um, we work with the current crop of uh, partners, some of which are bigger, more established developers and publishers in the space with plenty of indies that we work with and love to work with as well from first time developers to small teams that are releasing their end to game and looking for the appropriate marketing help on that. So the uh, case study I wanted to bring to your attention is a game called The Ouroboros King. Have you ever heard of that game? Yes, two people, good marketing. <laughs> The reason I want to have that game a little bit differently maybe from uh, what you might expect me to say is I think this is a good example of what I spoke about this morning with regards to um, the kind of game that you decide to make will determine a lot of the marketing decisions that you'll then have down the line. And what happened was it was a Spanish developer by the name of Oriol. He uh, comes from a software developer background, data scientist, so knew, how, knew his way about computers. Decided, you know what, I want to dip my hands into making a game. So he made a little game which I know, six months, beauty coding, got his feet wet, decided, okay, I want to make my commercial game. But he had a lot of time to think about what does he actually want to make and release for his first game. He thought, hey, chess is a game, it's time tested, turn based combat, what's more to love? And he also thought about, what if I combine that with something like Slay the Spire roguelike mechanics? And so what he has is a chess roguelike. He thought, that's feasible, I can do that with coding, I can make it look okay, let's go and do it. So within the space of 12 months from his deciding on the idea, scoping it out, put the Steam page up, 12 months later, he launches the game. For the first 10 months, the Steam page had a grand total of 500 wish lists. Now, that is not great. But what Oriel did during that time was he was experimenting with different kinds of marketing. He tried social media, he tried Reddit posts, Twitter, um, Imca, all these different kind of places, and they weren't quite working for him. So what he had planned for the last two months of his uh, pre-launch marketing was, okay, let's write to roguelike streamers that he researched based on similar games, based on uh, creators that he thought would like his game that he was making based on their previous videos. And he used um, best practices in terms of how to reach out to the streamers, in terms of what to say, the assets they had available for them, in terms of the press kit. Um, also put together something like a, a nice and neat trailer, got straight to the point, showcased the gameplay straight away. And then he timed the outreach alongside a Steam Next Test. And he planned to launch within a few weeks after the Next Test as well. And they got the game picked up by content creators. They really enjoyed it. He had a solid core gameplay loop. And he went from 500 wish lists two weeks before launch to 20,000 wish lists by the time he launched, which is quite an increase in a short amount of time. Now, to critique himself, being his first game, not going to be too harsh on him, he, that, led, that led him a lot of feedback. And so he polished the game like mad, which is really good for him, really implemented a lot of feedback, but it left him with like having to cut features and also having some bugs for launch. But the fact that he had the state of mind to actually make a plan to go ahead with it, even despite his earlier failures, and see the results of it bear fruit. You saw, okay, this game's got some potential. He decided post launch to keep working on content updates, brought localization, ported it to mobiles, and then a year later decided to go full time in this. He's now in a sustainable position to make his next game. And I want to highlight that as a, a smaller marketing example because I know all of us have different situations in the room. Some of us are bootstrapping our first game or work with a team or might have other aspirations for the future. It's an example of where someone who's thought carefully about what kind of game they want to make, trying different kinds of marketing in light of that, found something that worked, uh, wrote like content creators and next test, and then based on the reception of players, then kept working on the game, and now is in a, a position for the next couple of years to work on his next project, which I imagine would probably be a similar turnaround. You know, because some people can work for years and years on a game, which is totally fine, but he had a very sustainable feasible mindset in terms of his abilities, why, what he could talk about with the game, and what he felt like would be reasonable success. And so I thought that'd be good to highlight, you know, I can send you a link so you can ask me for the actual blog post Morton that you wrote about it. And you can go and look at the store page as well, so if you followed all the best practices for that. I thought we had a good example of where, I'm pretty sure he did a DIY as well, but he learned from other people, took the creative genius of others, applied it to his own situation, and then made yourself a sustainable indie game out of it as well. So I thought it would be a, a good and interesting highlight for you to look into for yourselves if you wanted.
So we've got a couple of minutes. If anybody has any questions, once we have our marketing experts, then uh, you can throw your hand up. But yeah, the question was, what would be your sort of top, top tips for, for marketing for Indies? I think working with like so many clients and looking at like aggro crowd games, one of the biggest thing is be authentic and be yourself. You don't want to tweet like a big corporation. You, you want to be yourself because that's why people play indie games. They want to know the people behind it and they want to know what the work you've put into it. Um, especially in today's day and age of like social media and people like really want to follow your personal Twitter. So I would say being authentic as you can and sharing the dev process is huge. Like even if you think it's not good content, other people are going to love seeing like how you got to your final point. Yeah, I would just echo that completely. Um, and I would also say, as part of that, find what your kind of tone of voice is. That sounds like a really kind of marketing-y, corporate-y thing to say. But when I say tone of voice, I don't necessarily mean you need to have a whole tone of voice document of things. I just mean find out what your company or your, your account or whatever it is, however you're communicating, how you're intending to speak and stick with it. Don't um, kind of hesitate in being yourself, being authentic. Um, and just stick with something that you find that works um, and that suits your community and your game as well. I think um, you need to think about your hook. So what is it about your game that is distinct, that is um, something that provides a twist, or it could be something about the art, it could be something about the gameplay, it could be a twist you give into a genre that your game is in. You need to work on honing, describing that, whether it's through your visual assets, your art, your trailers, your screenshots. Work on, work on showing that through your copy, like your store page descriptions, how you talk about the game to press and streamers, or on social media. And alongside that point, make a plan, but also experiment. Like you can make a plan ahead of time based on what you've seen others do, what you think is good based on you know what you've seen elsewhere. But to actually get to the to get on the ground and actually make this make this thing work out there, only then can based on that feedback of what channels are working well, what channels aren't working so well, you can push on your strengths, keep using that, and if there's weaknesses, well, change tactics, try something different, or even just drop it. Focus on what's giving you the best returns based on what resources and time you have available as well. Yeah, that's all we've got time for. So, yeah, that's all we've got time for. Um, big round of applause for Agency Power. <laughs> so, these guys will be hanging around, so uh, if you want to get some, you know, free consultants.